she's about to come out. Look at Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy New Year, and welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and uh, we're, we're, we're very uh, pleased to, to be uh, hosting Kate Anderson Brower this afternoon, uh, here to talk about her new book, Elizabeth Taylor, The Grit and Glamour of an Icon. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor, Kate writes, uh, led the most glamorous and colorful life of any movie star in the world. She appeared in 56 films and 10 TV movies over 60 years and throughout much of the 20th century uh, was the epitome of, a, uh, of movie stardom. Uh, at the same time, her personal life, which included eight marriages to seven different men and <laughs> struggles with addictions to pills and alcohol, often generated uh, headlines uh, along with the coverage of her accomplishments. Uh, she was not just a, a world famous actress, but a successful businesswoman who earned a fortune as a celebrity perfumer and an activist who devoted herself to the fight against HIV and AIDS, raising millions of dollars for research and, and patient care. Uh, Kate chronicles it all in, in this authorized biography drawing on previously unpublished letters, private notes, and uh, in interview transcripts. Uh, she describes Elizabeth as a lot of things, kind, creative, whip-smart, self-indulgent, empathetic, selfish, greedy, romantic, vulnerable, and childlike. Above all, Kate adds, uh, Elizabeth uh, Taylor was authentic, and she was a survivor. She lived decades longer than Marilyn Monroe, the only other actress who approaches her phenomenal level of fame. Publishers Weekly summed up Kate's book as a mesmerizing appreciation of a legendary star. The book's a, a bit of a departure uh, for Kate in as much as her previous books focused on aspects of the American presidency. Uh, the works include The Residents, First Women, Team of Five, First in Line, uh, and, and a children's book, Exploring the White House. Uh, but like these earlier books, the, the new biography exhibits Kate's skills as a thorough researcher and graceful writer. Uh, she's a journalist by training and appears these days on CNN as a contributor. Previously, she covered the White House for Bloomberg News during the first term of the Obama administration. And before that, she worked at CBS News as a staff member and Fox News as a producer. Uh, Kate will be in conversation this, other, uh, this afternoon with another journalist uh, whom many of you uh, may recognize. She's Carol Lee, who has been covering the White House for a decade and a half, previously for the Wall Street Journal and Politico, and in recent years for NBC News. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kate Anderson Brower and Carol Lee. Thank you. Thank you so and much. Thank, thank all you of you. Both. Yes. It's nice um, to be here with my friend Kate. We've known each other for a really long time. So if we divulge into reminiscing, just <laughs> give us a nudge and we'll stop. Um, as Brad mentioned, this is a departure for you, this book. It's also the first authorized biography of Elizabeth Taylor. Can you start by maybe talking about how the family chose to you to do this yep. project? Sure, um, and thank you, Carol, so much for doing We've known each other for 13 years, um, and she's been so supportive of me taking this kind of crazy departure from my old... Very <laughs> successful departure. Well, but yeah. it's been a strange ride. Um, I came to this book, so as Brad said, I, I usually write about uh, White House history, and um, I was looking for a subject that wasn't as divisive um, as something to do with President Trump and what was going on in our culture at the time. This was back in 2018 when I was thinking about other topics. And my husband actually suggested that I talk to John Warner because Senator Warner, who's a Virginia senator, a Republican, um, was Elizabeth's sixth husband. And 
um, just a really interesting person. And I thought, what a great magazine story, maybe, about a celebrity coming to Washington. What did she think of her time here? She, she hated it, uh, side note. Um, and Senator Warner was amazing. He invited me to his home in Virginia. They live in Alexandria. And he said, I want people, a younger generation, to know about Elizabeth. Because even though they had been divorced for a long time, they still loved each other. They were still good friends. And um, he put me in touch with Elizabeth's son, Chris. She had four children. And um, originally, I thought, well, maybe I could just do a book about her Washington years or maybe just her time as an AIDS activist, because that's so interesting to me. And the trustees of her estate and her children said, actually, we're looking for someone to write a biography of her whole life. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my god, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a much bigger ask. Um, and, uh, and it was, you know, as a journalist, I was a little bit reticent about working with them because I didn't want them to have too much editorial input in what I was doing. But they did open up this archive of thousands of letters and diaries and things that I would never have gotten the chance to see had I not agreed to work with them. So that's how it came about. So what was that like? So, you know, as a journalist and as somebody who wrote your own nonfiction books after leaving journalism, you have your own editorial direction. What was it like to have to not just answer to yourself and your editor, um, but this whole family who obviously had a lot of emotion invested in that. And then on top of that, you you know, we all love to have a lot of reporting to put together um, a final product, but you must have had tons of stuff that you had to go through. So yeah. can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, um, at the end of it, there were thousands of pages of notes, and they opened the door to interviews with people that would have been really tricky for me to get famous people who I would have had to jump through a lot of hoops to get, like Demi Moore and uh, Lionel Richie and all these famous people who knew Elizabeth. And um, they were able to put in a war, Brooke Shields and people like that. Um, but Such a name dropper. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, I gotta be. Um, but like getting those names was a big deal. And... Um, Colin Farrell, I'm going to have to name another, do another name drop. He was amazing. He was probably the best celebrity I interviewed for the book because he was very close with Elizabeth. And they had this sweet kind of romantic friendship at the end of her life, which I just thought was really lovely and different. Um, so, but working with them every week, we'd have a Zoom call. And it was tricky because of her, she has four kids. She was married eight times to seven men. So one of her grandkids was the grandson of Mike Todd. Uh, you know, another grand, grandson is Michael Wilding's grandson. So you're, you know, and who was the love of her life, Mike Todd or Richard Burton? You know, you didn't want to say one over another because the Mike Todd grandson thinks it was Mike Todd, right? Um, so there was some of that. And then um, they did get to go through the manuscript and we did, uh, talk about things and whether or not, you know, there's a moment in the book that I kept in about um, when Richard Burton was uh, trying to stop drinking and he was really had a huge alcohol problem. And Elizabeth was also an, an addict and she would give him bits of gin as a way to try to get him to stop drinking because she thought he hated gin and he was suffering so much. And I just thought, this is a really strange thing to do if you're in this situation. You shouldn't be giving an alcoholic alcohol. Um, and, you know, her, her very good friend and assistant was saying, you know, but Elizabeth just couldn't stand to see him suffer, you know. And so, you know, I would put that in, but I also insisted on keeping the story of what she actually did in the book because I think her complexity. They wanted you to take it out? Uh, well, there was some talk about like tempering it a little bit um, and making it more a little bit more sympathetic to the situation she was in. She didn't know Richard when he wasn't an alcoholic. So it was he was a different person. Um, so I but I really wanted to be truthful to her story. I mean she was far from perfect. And I think that her friends and family finally realized that they would say after a decade since she died when I started working on this book, that that was what made her interesting. And she wouldn't want a book about her to profess that she was a perfect person. So. And how much material did you have to go through? I mean, it was 7,000 
letters, diary entries. She wrote these amazing letters after people died that are kind of almost therapeutic and confessional notes. Like after Michael Jackson died, they were very close. She wrote a letter to him after Richard Burton died. Um, she wrote several letters to him about how much she missed him, but then also reflecting on their life together. Um, she didn't believe in therapy. She wasn't from that generation. She wasn't terribly introspective. She just lived her life day to day, full on passion, um, made a lot of mistakes along the way. But um, so I felt like the letters were appearing into her inner like psyche. And it's, I loved the letters. Um, um, and I have, I don't want to read a bunch of them, but in the book, I mean, I think the thing about the book that's interesting is the letters, um, the most interesting part because they haven't been published before. Um, and one of the, in the, the most passionate letters are between Elizabeth and Richard Burton. They were married, um, twice, once for 10 years and once for one year. And, um, they're beautiful writers. So he wrote to her, Dearest Elizabeth, you asked me to write to you the truth about us. Prometheus was punished by the gods forever and is still suffering in all of us for inventing fire and stealing it from the gods. I am forever punished by the gods for being given the fire and trying to put it out. The fire, of course, is you. I cannot put you out. You will always be like some ineradicable, ineluctable sulfur in my inadequate and vulnerable hands. Very volatile. I mean, very beautiful though. Like, what an amazing writer. Um, and then as their, as their relationship kind of evolves in 1969, she writes to him, as long as he loves her, everything is okay. Pimples, stupid hips, double chins and all. She loved him more than her life and always will. Wife. And I thought it was sweet. It's very sweet. So can yeah. we put to rest who was the love of her life? I think Richard Burton, you got to say, okay. yeah. Okay. yeah. Now, just, there's not very many of us here. Is there anything you didn't include that was too juicy or, you know, you didn't feel the family didn't want you to include or anything that you couldn't have included that maybe you want to tell all of us about? Um, if this wasn't put online, I might. <laughs> I might. Um, you know, she did have a lot of, she did have some rivalries with other female um actresses and her biggest rivalry was with Sophia Loren who she thought was trying to steal Richard away from her um, and so she really hated Sophia Loren and there's a lot of juicy stuff about that and her jealousy and she would get mad that Sophia and Richard would start speaking Italian in front of her and Elizabeth couldn't speak Italian and I mean they probably did have an affair there's some stuff in the book about Richard and Sophia working on a film together and and it wouldn't be at all surprising and Richard had a lot of like he did cheat on Elizabeth he was not someone who could be faithful so I would say that's the that's some juicy stuff what would you say about her story because um, it's really a snapshot of an era that just doesn't exist anymore what would you say about her story is relevant today I mean I think that's what's so interesting about Elizabeth is that she was taking on issues that we still talk about today. I mean, she was talking about going to Betty Ford when nobody else was talking about addiction. She was talking about HIV and AIDS when nobody was, it was a radioactive issue. In 1984 and 85, before Rock Hudson came out and said he was, um, he had AIDS, you know, everyone thought he had cancer. And even Elizabeth thought that. And um, she, hosted the first major Hollywood dinner for the called Commitment to Life um, in L.A. in 1985, raised over a million dollars. But what I loved the most about her work is the personal things that she did behind the scenes. She, she paid um, for experimental drug treatments for friends and people she didn't even know. She paid for people to be buried who she had never met because she said no mother's son is gonna stay on a cold hard slab in a morgue when I can pay for their burial. There's a lot of things she did behind the scenes that were not like celebrity activists today. It wasn't like a tweet or, you know, I want to get credit for being PC or whatever it is. It's like amazing. Yeah, you write that she would visit patients who were dying of AIDS in the hospital but insisted that it not be known and if it was she would cancel the visit yeah. and yeah. so she would show up with full hair and makeup mm -hmm. the giant 33 carat Krupp diamond 
on her left hand and she wanted them to meet a movie star before they died. And back then there were no treatments. And um, I interviewed several hospice workers who were in tears. And this was on the phone, like, you know, talking about what it was like to have Elizabeth Taylor come into the hospice and what the turnover was like, the death that they saw. Um, you know, there'd be averaging in a 15 bed hospice in San Francisco, uh, three deaths a week. And it was just the turnover and it was really traumatic. And then to have this celebrity say that you matter and it was at a time when there was so much homophobia. Mm -hmm. She had so many gay friends in her life. Um, Montgomery Clift, Rock Hudson, James Dean, um, who she, you know, who was bisexual, but she she exchanged a lot of private stories with him, and she just didn't think it mattered. She was for gay marriage decades before people were talking about it. So. Now, when you took on writing this book, there obviously she's one of the most well-known women in the world, and there's a lot that's been written about her, other biographies, unauthorized, um, and. What, was there something that you learned that surprised you about her or that stuck out that you hadn't known or maybe you prejudged something and it was not what you expected? I think it's just how complex she was, you know, um, how smart she was. She's the first actress to make a million dollars on a film, for male or, you know, male or female. She negotiated that. Um, but I also think how hard it was for her to balance motherhood. And like, we both have young kids. And so I think when you're in that stage of life, you think about how could you be Elizabeth Taylor and have four kids? And um, the kids actually were really open about how hard it was. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because she sent them away, right? Yeah. I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't the, the hands-on mom. mom but... No, I mean, I wouldn't judge her, but I think that she struggled with, she was like an empire to herself. Mm -hmm. She had this giant entourage. She was living on yachts. Um, she was making millions of dollars for herself and other people. And so she sent her four kids. Points when she was very addicted and her mm -hmm. asking him to do something that he just was beside himself about, inject her with... Yeah. Drugs. How is how are they when you were dealing with them? Are they? Is there a lot of? I don't know. Residual therapy. <laughs> What's the right word? <laughs> there should be. Um, there's a lot of. They call it intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. Of and it's hard to feel bad for someone who had made so much money, right, and so famous. But when you're her kids, and you feel like your mom is is not, you know, she's. Even to talk to their mother, they would have to go through assistance, you know, and sometimes the assistants would say she's too busy to talk to you, you know, and so she, you couldn't have your mom. And that scene with Chris Wilding, her son from her second marriage to Michael Wilding, Chris describes, you know, going in, this is when Elizabeth lived in D.C. and she hated it, as I said. We're going to um, get to that. Okay. Um, it's, uh, she was trying to inject herself with Demerol and she had her like skirt pulled up and she was like, please help me. And he just said, I'm not gonna do that. And, and it was just traumatic for him to have to witness that. And I think it was therapeutic for them to talk about it actually. Mm -hmm. um, because they have it. And then one of the children was adopted by Eddie Fisher and she didn't ever know him. And she was seated across from him at a dinner party and he said, you were meant to be mine. And, it, you know, she's like, this was just so strange. Like, this man was meant to be my father, but Richard Burton raised me. So it's also just the fact that there were so many men, I think, and yeah. so much volatility. And her own childhood was difficult. And her relationship with her mother was very conflicted. Yeah, her mom was like the ultimate stage mom. You know, she, she was a moderately successful actress, but she saw Elizabeth as somebody who could really make it big in Hollywood. And so she pushed her majorly and would stand behind the camera and do all sorts of hand gestures to try to get Elizabeth to do certain things. And then at one point in National Velvet, Elizabeth's granddaughters, I interviewed two of them, and they described watching National Velvet with their grandmother. And Elizabeth said, oh yeah, in that scene, my mom said my hands looked fat. I always remember that. And it's like, God, you were 12 years old. Also, who has fat hands? It's not even like a thing. <laughs> her mom thought it was a thing. So it stuck with her, that comment. So I think she really had to struggle too. Um, 
her, she's very well known for her marriages, obviously, and the men in her life. Um, why do you think she was, after sifting through all the letters, all the things, talking to the children, why do you think she married so many times? Um, I think it was a way to escape being Elizabeth Taylor. I think it was, you know, if she could be Mrs. Nikki Hilton. Nikki Hilton was her first husband. She was a teenager. He was very abusive to her. Um, and I'm trying to think of how he's related to Paris Hilton, but I never I think it's like it an uncle, great uncle, uncle kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then they named Nikki after him. Anyway. But so Nikki Hilton was awful and so abusive. And then um, Michael Wilding was lovely to her, but he thought she thought he was boring. Like she craved volatility. And she, um, I think being Mrs. John Warner was a way to escape. Like she went to the farm in Virginia and was like, this is amazing. I could ride horses and not be Elizabeth Taylor. And she then, cooked, which I found I know, interesting. She yeah. did. She liked to cook. Um, there's a photo in the book of her, you know, she's got like a scarf on her head mm -hmm. and she looks nothing like herself, but she was really unhappy. And I think that she never could, her m best years were when she was single. I mean, that was when she was doing her AIDS work, which she's most known for. Do you, I want to talk about that because do you, you've, you've said that a couple of times and it's very clear in, in the book. And is that because she wasn't being dragged down by some relationship? Was it because she was also older when she was doing and more mature when she was doing that kind of work? I think it just kind of, it fed into everything that she was, which was someone who was just brimming over with empathy. I mean, she couldn't, she, she couldn't stand to see other people in pain, be it family, strangers, whatever it was, because she had had so much pain in her life. She had physical pain from when she was thrown off a horse in National Velvet, which made her an opioid addict the rest of her life. Um, and she just she couldn't, it, it fed into everything that was, I think, good about her, her AIDS work, you know? And it was a way to channel that. And maybe because she didn't have a man to kind of, I don't know, weigh her down, but some of her choices of men were not <laughs> the best. So yeah. I think it was when she could be herself, truly. So her marriage to Senator Warner brought her to Washington, D.C., and one of the things that she said is that Washington, D.C. was the loneliest city in the world for a woman, that you had to be so many things and nothing all at once. Talk about her time here, because she seemed to dazzle in it, and she knew Reagan, and she called him Ronnie, and she was in the Oval, and pitching him on you know, coming to her AIDS benefit when nobody else would, and yet she gained a ton of weight and became a serious drug addict and really did, was unhappy. Probably, the it, to me, reading the book, it was, it was to like her most unhappy point in her life. No, definitely. She, she felt like she wasn't, it, this wasn't her world. Like she didn't have a lot of friends in Washington. People expected her to come here, she said, and be like Pearl Mesta and like be this socialite and host all these incredible parties. And that's not what she wanted to do at all. She wanted to recapture her childhood in England, where she, that was her happiest time, was riding horses, she said, before she was famous. I think it was always trying to escape the fame, and then this love-hate relationship with the fame, because she couldn't have a 33-carat diamond ring without being Elizabeth Taylor. So, And she loved the jewelry, and she loved the yachts, and all of that, but I think she was Yes, Senator it. Warner said, give up the yacht, take off the jewelry, Yep. You got to wear more tweed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they actually told her to stop wearing purple mm -hmm. because she said why, and she, they said because it connotes, or because it means it's passion, and that's not what Republican politics is about, and it doesn't look right. So as soon as he actually won, she wore this amazing purple Halston caftan to the party. She was very happy about that. But um, she was always kind of bucking... The, the confines of, I mean, Washington's pretty traditional, and she is not. You don't say. Yeah. <laughs> you might know this. So, and she was just a free thinker, non judgmental person. She was a feminist, even though she wouldn't have called herself a feminist. She believed women should be able to serve in the military, um, and John Warner did not, and they would argue about this. Um, you know, there was a lot of. She was very unhappy, I think, also because he was a Republican and it wasn't 
how she felt. She wanted to take out ads for gun control. And I found this great letter that Senator Warner wrote her and said, please, you know, rethink this. Um, it's not a great, this was after Reagan was almost assassinated and she was upset. She was going to take out a New York Times full page ad with a bunch of her celebrity friends. And he actually said, you know, Elizabeth, darling, please, this is bad for both of us. Think of what this could do. And obviously it was bad for him. And she did it anyway. He also left her on Valentine's Day to go vote, which seemed very, you know, <laughs> that wasn't the not a good he idea. He was an old school gentleman. For, you know, I do think he was a good person, but they were not good together. But they had a friendship for the rest mm -hmm. of, basically the rest of her the, life. The rest of her life. And he said that when she was starting to do White Diamonds, she came into the room and said, like, I'm, I'm testing out these different fragrances. Do you want to invest in this company? And he said no, because it might be against Senate ethics rules or something. And he's like, I wish to God I had done that. Because <laughs> yeah, no the kidding. the most successful celebrity <laughs> perfume. <laughs> You talked about her work um, with HIV and AIDS, but can you expand upon that? Because it's really significant what she did and her willingness to put herself out there and, and literally just physically touch people who were dying of AIDS in addition to everything else she was doing at the fundraising. Why do you think she got involved with that? And just expand upon her impact. I mean, I really do think it's because of these friendships from her early days, and not just with Monty Clift and other huge celebrities at the time, but also because of assistant directors and writers and people she knew in Hollywood who were gay and the real creative forces behind a lot of her work. Um, and so I think it was that understanding. And she also felt like an outsider her whole life. You know, she never went to high school. She went to school on the MGM set. She had trouble finding a boyfriend. She never went to the prom. Like all these things that we take for granted, she couldn't have. And um, one of the best th stories I think is that when she was in a meeting with L.B. Mayer, this much feared MGM studio head, he was berating her mother about something. And Elizabeth was a teenager and she said, you know, don't talk to my mother like that. You can't. And she stormed out of the office. And everybody said, Elizabeth, you have to go back in and apologize. And she refused to apologize because she just wasn't, that wasn't what she, she felt like he was wrong. And she wasn't fired. And she said from that moment on, she learned this very cynical lesson that she just made them too much money and that everything's about money and that it wasn't about her. It was about this commodity that was created for her. And it, it wasn't anything she deserved which is really amazing to think of when you're a teenager to understand that. Yeah, and then to, as she was older, she recognized that her celebrity could also basically be used to get Ronald Reagan to go yeah. to the, her dinner for yeah. aid, to benefit AIDS. And she would go to these hospices, and like I think celebrities today could learn a lot from her because she would go to a hospice when she was on a perfume tour, and she would donate a certain amount of money, and then she would have the perfume co company have to match her contribution. Um, and then she would have the department store where they sold the perfume, Macy's, match that. So it was like tripling her impact. And so everything she did was very savvy and business, you know. She was a smart person. I think sometimes we look at her as just this glamorous mm -hmm. icon, but there was a lot more to her. We're going to take a hard turn to Colin Farrell because we, I need to do a deep dive on this relationship. And he was it with Ellen DeGeneres where he said she was yeah. basically the love of his life. <laughs> yeah. And they never actually even kissed, right? So. And they didn't go on dates. Or well, they, they I mean, they, they went on dates, but they were not like... <laughs> Not, not platonic dates. Yes. yes. That's not a date. No. Date. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fair, fair point. They went to dinner. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's really sweet because he was his, his, t um, so Tim Mendelson, who's Elizabeth's assistant for two decades, was really, really loved Colin Farrell. And they were at the hospital because Elizabeth, like, was in the hospital all the time for some surgery. Colin was there, um, I think it was Cedar sinai because his child had been, yeah, his child was born, and they ran into each other. And somehow it came to be, Colin found out, oh my God, you're Elizabeth Taylor's assistant, I love her. And um, 
the next, like a couple weeks later, Colin ends up sending her flowers. She invites them to the house and they have this connection because he's this bad boy, you know, Irish, like, you know, tattoos. He actually slid down his his pants to show her his tattoo during your interview yeah. uh, no no oh. no not me like, no not oh. me elizabeth <laughs> that would have been interesting <laughs> yeah that would have been fun um no but he he was just like brash and body and so was she she swore like a sailor he does too and they like to drink together and have fun and um at one point he took her wheelchair because they everyone around her kind of treated her like this queen and he was like you know what elizabeth let's just go to the polo lounge and have dinner takes her wheelchair throws it in the back of the car drives to the polo lounge she has caviar and champagne and her assistant was like god it was so awesome to see that because for us to take her out at that point would have been this big production and Colin just like made it happen and he would go and sit next to her bedside and they would listen to Richard Burton doing Hamlet on the speakers like it's it's really sweet and he said if she was younger maybe they would have been a thing from do you think he thinks that do you yeah. think she thought that oh she would have at that point yeah if he had like I mean, why not yeah <laughs> her kids called him Papa Colin and they all thought that if if she had been interested if he had been willing they would have had a real romantic relationship because she never gave up on love they say that's sweet yeah I want to get to questions but I also just want to ask you quickly about some of her relationships with other famous women at the time. Like, what was her relationship like with Marilyn Monroe? She was jealous of Sophia Loren, obviously. Um, but did she, what were her relationships like with some of her peers at that time? She, she, um, the really interesting thing is I had access to these unpublished um, transcripts from her bio, she did an autobiography that was pretty tame back in when she was in her 30s. And there were all these things that she said that were left out of the bio, auto, the memoir. Um, one of which was what she thought of Marilyn Monroe, who had passed away, and she said, you know, in this tra interview transcript, she said, like, that could have been me. I mean, that could have easily happened to me. And she felt bad for Marilyn. She also was really mad at Arthur Miller because he wrote a play that's you know loosely based on Marilyn's life or their marriage, and um, they wanted um, Elizabeth to play Marilyn in it on stage. And she was like, "I would never in a million years do that to her, because it made her look bad." So she was loyal to an extent. Yeah. Great. Um, I think we can turn it over to questions. Oh, great! Please. Is this on? Uh, Patricia Fenn from Prince George's County, thank you so much for coming. We're very thrilled to see you. Uh, can you tell us about what her children are doing? There are four of them, and they came at different times in her life with different men. Can you tell us what they're doing now? Thank you for your question. No, um, they are not in a Hollywood. They're not, they're not, in, I mean, they, some of them live there, but they're not interested in that world. Um, her, one of her sons lives in England, Michael. Um, and yes, he he's retired. He did do some acting. He was in some soap operas early on in his life. Chris Wilding, her other son with Michael Wilding, did some behind the scenes work. He's an amazing writer, um, but he hasn't published anything yet. Um, her, her daughter, Liza, is a very accomplished um, equestrian sculptor. So she has these gorgeous um, sculptures of horses and they live in upstate New York. And then Maria Burton, who is adopted, um, I believe she's also in upstate New York, and I'm not sure if she's what she's doing right now, but she has children, and they all have great kids, and they're all pretty well adjusted considering, you know, the life that they had. Have they given you any feedback on your book? Chris did, and it was funny because he texted me and said, do you have a minute to talk, which is always scary. Oh, um, boy. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to hear that as a reporter. Um, but then once I got on the phone with him, he said it, he was really happy with it. He learned some things from it himself. He pointed out one thing, which has to do with the house in um, that they had in Puerto Vallarta in Mexico technically wasn't connected by a bridge. So, I mean, there was a little thing that I was like, in the paperback edition, I will change that, Chris. But as long as you're happy with everything else, it's great. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, ha I have a question concerning 
what Elizabeth Taylor might have thought about something. And this was uh, uh, her image that was used by Andy Warhol to, uh, as, as kind of like an iconic image there. And did she have, I, I've seen uh, various versions of this over the years, and I've always wondered what she thought about being used in that way or memorialized in that way. That's a great question. Thank you. I've, I, I actually was interested in that as a cover. Um, but you have to go through the Warhol Foundation and it's a whole big thing. Um, they, uh, she was not happy. She was not happy with it because she didn't get any money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so he just took her image. Um, I have it in the book. I think it's from Butterfield 8. It's this amazing, amazing image and made a ton of money and helped make his career out of it. And she didn't get a cent. Um, eventually they were friends and he gave her like a, a copy of it that she hung in her house. But no, she was not happy. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a question about Mike Todd. Um, I remember when Mike Todd died, Photoplay magazine came out with a special that said, Liz and Mike, there are 413 thrilling days together. And I'm wondering what your opinion is. Had Mike Todd lived, what do you think her life might have been like? You know, and I've thought a lot about this. They were married for a little over a year. They had Eliza together. Um, it's really interesting because Liza's, Liza always thought that on her birth certificate it was Mike Todd, but it was really Richard Burton because he had adopted her by that point. So that just shows you how kind of crazy this life was. Um, I mean, given her track record, I, I don't think they would have stayed together necessarily if you're being completely fair, but I do think that he was the f her first entry point into this really glamorous incredible life and he was absolutely head over heels in love with her but he was also abusive physically she was abusive to him debbie reynolds described seeing them hitting each other i mean it was really volatile so um i don't think they would have stayed together can i ask you about debbie reynolds um can you uh, can you just talk about what the relationship was with elizabeth and I Debbie. love that relationship because they, you know, they never hated each other the way the press made them out to be. And Debbie and Eddie were already, their relationship was already falling apart. And she, Elizabeth always referred to um, Eddie Fisher as Edna <laughs> for the rest of her life. He was the only husband that he, she absolutely hated. And Debbie hated him too. And they were both so happy that he was out of their lives. So they bonded over their shared dislike of Eddie Fisher, who was, sounds like kind of not, a uh, kind of schmuck. He was not nice to either of them. And he made a lot of money off of both of those relationships. So, hi. The question I came up to ask is, could you address briefly her reputation as an actress, which I seem to remember was not that great until Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you could write so many volumes about her life. You could write a book just about her movies, right? And this is more about her as a, as a mother, as a wife, as a person. But I mean, I, I think Virginia Woolf, she won two Oscars, one for Butterfield 8, which she said was not a good movie. And she got it because she had a tracheotomy. And, um, and uh, so and Shirley MacLaine famously said, I lost to a tracheotomy, you know? It was not the best movie. Um, but Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was her best, I mean, I think, and it's so subjective, her best film. But she did A Place in the Sun suddenly last summer. She had other great films before then, and National Velvet. I mean, she had a lot of great movies before then. If I can ask one more that occurred to me when you were just speaking, do you think that the craving for volatility in relationships came from what you described as her relationship with her mother and the, the pushing and the, the craziness of having a stage mother? Yeah, I think, I think so. And I think also in the book I talk for the first time about abuse from her father. And so he, was, he physically abused her as well. So having that, um, that kind of abuse and that physical... You know, I, it's really complicated because she would 
pick fights and be violent and then you know people would hit her back and it was this I'm sure it's deep seated in her childhood and at MGM they were giving them drugs too to stay awake to go to sleep I mean this is the last of this is the Judy Garland era the very end of it and so that also started her on this path of addiction so I think everything is rooted in her childhood look well, on her father she was very empathetic about him later and there's this scene in the book where she's in his lap I think she's in her 20s and they're sobbing together and so it sounds like I mean it seemed like she understood where he was coming from even though he was abusive and that also mirrors her relationships later in life yeah I think that's true I mean I think that he he felt a lot of resentment towards her mother because he felt like she was being taken away from him you know he could he would have to like make an appointment to see his daughter and she was making more money than he was when she was nine years old. And so... Yeah, she says she emasculated him, essentially, yeah. in her view. And yeah, and she, I think that's like her way of rationalizing it. And to sort of give him some, you know, to try to make it logical that he would be abusive towards her. I don't think it ever is, but she kind of tried to work it out in her head that way, yeah. You mentioned a number of her roles as, as really, and they are really good movies, the ones that you mentioned. And she worked with a lot of Mount, you know, the directors who will be on Mount Rushmore when the history of film is all put together. Did she have any particular regard for any of them, uh, uh, admire their abilities? And particularly Mankiewicz, after directing her in Suddenly Last Summer, mm -hmm. was then brought in to bring Cleopatra home, essentially. Yeah. I mean, she loved Richard Brooks, and I mean, I forgot, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Giant. I mean, these are amazing movies. Um, she and George Stevens had a, a close relationship, but it was also kind of volatile because um, there were many times on sets when he would kind of break her down almost and get her to the point of tears for a scene. Um, but she had a lot of respect for those directors. And they sometimes, and Mike Nichols for Who's right. Afraid of Virginia Woolf, she <laughs> argued to get him. It was his first movie. They were so young. And she said she and Richard Burton had so much clout that they could pick their director, which never happens. Right. And they picked Mike Nichols, who was a Broadway you know, director at the time. And Mike was reticent. He kind of... There are these great letters between him and Ernest Lehman, who was a producer on the film, where he says, Richard is going to walk away with this movie. He is so amazing. I'm not sure about Elizabeth as Martha. It's just not working. And it's like, well, she won the Oscar and Richard didn't, which I love. She was kind of underestimated. And he was jealous, no? Yeah, Richard was really jealous of Elizabeth. I think if he was honest, he would say that he thought she was a better screen I think she was a better screen actor and he was a better stage actor, so they can make each other better. Um, but I think a lot of, one thing you didn't ask is about the jewelry. It's and on my I list. say <laughs> that the jewelry was... The 72 epic. wigs? <laughs> yeah, the, the wigs were amazing, the clothes were eh. She was kind of all over with the style. But the jewels were a $150 million sale, more than that, at Christie's, the biggest private jewelry collection in the world rivaled by only the Queen of England um, and other royal families around the world. Um, she had such an eye for jewelry. And it was like, I talked to the head of Christie's and Sotheby's jewelry departments, and they actually competed to get her estate. And they would go and like wine and dine her, and try, you know, it, anticipating her death, which must have been a very strange thing for her. Um, and she would lay out the jewels and walk through, you know, this is the Taj Mahal diamond that Richard gave me, and this is when, and she had all of the boxes kept and wrote down the dates and the husbands who gave her each piece, <laughs> which I love. When you talk about her as a mother, though, she sold some of her pieces to get money at, at the time or to, yeah. to keep the family afloat. She sold, yeah. I mean, yes, a lot of that money was dispersed among her family. Um, she has an AIDS foundation, and so her name and likeness. So whenever you see, like, cute quotes, like, you know, put on your lipstick and get your life together, or whatever these great lip, you know, quotes are from Elizabeth, that money goes towards her AIDS foundation. So they've kind of kept that separate. Hi, Kate. I'm so excited to read this book, especially after having read, you know, all of the, what you've written about the White House. And I wonder if you can just talk about being 
a White House historian now looking into Hollywood and how that process might be different or the same and how you think of, of the impact of those two worlds, uh, you know, overall and how they might compare. Um, thank you, Nitra. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think some people might think this is more of a frivolous topic than First Ladies, for instance, but I think of her as so culturally impactful and iconic that I think of her on the level of some First Ladies. Um, in that what she did for HIV and AIDS in particular and addiction is really it, it just so consequential. So I think of, there's no celebrity like her that comes to this level, that rises to this level of being both a great actress and a great, I mean, she was the first influencer, um, but a deeply flawed person at the same time, which is so interesting. But I think her time in Washington touches on politics, um, but I also think that, you know, it was, it was a really nice break <laughs> from writing about what's going on. Like, you know, I, I didn't want to write about the Trump era or any of that because it's also such a crowded space and um, it's just such a, it's such a negative, it was a, it was a negative period of time for a lot of people and I wanted to do something that was more uplifting. So that's... That's why. I that makes it. sense. Yeah. Did you find that Hollywood is equally as kind of backbiting and conniving? Is there a similar overlap between the way that um. Washington works <laughs> and the way Hollywood works? Yes, <laughs> definitely. There were great, I mean, so I'm not like, it, it might seem as though I think she's the most amazing person ever to walk the face of the earth. I did fall in love with her a little bit, and I think you always do when you're writing a biography. But one thing that she did that I thought was really amazing is she stood up for people. Like, there's a lot of backbiting where, you know, director um, Mike Nichols for Virginia Woolf had hired an assi assistant director, and it was one of Elizabeth's friends. And at the last minute, he changed his mind. Mind and said, actually, I don't, I don't want him anymore. And I found these letters where Elizabeth is like, that's like a really terrible way to treat somebody. You know, this is my friend. I promised him a job and we have to deliver. And I kind of feel like those little things, you know, she wasn't standing up for some big shot producer. It was just for some, some guy she was friends with who she thought deserved the job. So there's a lot of stuff that she had to stand up for other people. She, she tried to stand up for Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe was being treated really badly on her last movie set, and Elizabeth said she would walk out of Cleopatra in like an act of solidarity. And Marilyn said, you don't need to do that. But, you know, there are those little things that, but then on the flip side, not answering your daughter's calls when she needs you, mm -hmm. and not being there for your kids when they, they really desperately want you in their lives is the flip side of her life. Do we have any other questions? Or if not, I have some. Oh, oh, oh. great. <laughs> so are, are, are her papers now going to be archived somewhere? Are they, is, are they going to be publicly accessible online no. or someplace else? They're, you know, um, they, the family really holds on to them because they're, they're valuable to them. And in fact, like when, when certain places like Vanity Fair excerpted the book and I wanted to give them some things that weren't in the book, that was not gonna fly. Mm. They, they hold on to their <laughs> material very closely. I mean, it is, um, during COVID, I did a lot of the research, so a lot of it is online, but it's all like password protected and everything. So there's an archivist. There's some, the House of Taylor on Wilshire Boulevard, and they have her old mm -hmm. costumes. They have these boxes full of papers and diaries, and everything is online archived. And there's actually somebody whose job it is to do that, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining us today. Um, it's my understanding that uh, Elizabeth um, converted to Judaism during her adult life, and I was wondering if the letters that you read or any of the other materials that you read shed any light on the importance or the, the role that her faith or uh, religion played in her daily life, her decision making, her activism, or, or anything really. Yeah, thank you. That's that is an important part of her story. Um, a lot of people think it's because of Mike Todd, but she said she actually turned to Judaism um, herself. I think she felt very much conflicted um, later on in life. You know, she was condemned by the Vatican for her relationship with Richard Burton, 
and she she had converted to Judaism. I do think it was partially to honor Mike Todd's memory. He was killed suddenly in a plane crash. Um, she was not raised particularly religious. Her mother was a Christian scientist, and she wasn't given medicine growing up. Um, and so I think that's that, ironic. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I think she. I, I don't know a ton of why she converted, but I know that she wasn't um, going to be a Christian scientist because she obviously believed in medicine. And she also <laughs> wasn't going to be Catholic. She wasn't raised with, in the Catholic faith. And so for her, it was a way to honor Mike Todd. And then it was also just a religion that she was interested in. But she was very much involved in Israel. And at a, at a certain point during the, um, you know, she was volunteering. There was a plane that was hijacked in Egypt, and she volunteered herself to be traded for the hostages, which is amazing. Um, and Tibet, yeah. And it was an amazing thing that happened. And I, always, I did ask. I never got an answer if she actually would have done it. If they said, okay, we'll take your life in exchange for these dozens of people. But she did offer, which is kind of amazing. I think she would have done it. Sorry, I'm Sandra McElwain. I've been a journalist here for I don't want to tell you how many years. I'm now with the Daily Beast. Um, but I did the cover story when John for Ladies Home Journal when John and Elizabeth um, got married and went down to the farm, and um, David Kennelly did the uh, did the uh, the pics. We I said to Elizabeth, get up on the tractor, and she said, okay. It was an experience. I want to tell you, I've, I've done maybe a thousand celebrity profiles, but with Elizabeth, it was just an experience that will never be repeated. And I could write a whole book on just my four or five <laughs> days traveling with these guys. But I have to tell you that John did tell me he thought my, and I'm not saying it's right, and that Mike Todd was the great love of her life. And if he had not died. John said she would have definitely stayed with him. Now, this is what? I mean, how many years yeah. ago did I do that story? It's a yeah. hell of a long time ago. But, um, no, no, it was just an amazing, I mean, uh, yeah. Elizabeth was just everything. But she was just a great, I always called her a good egg. <laughs> she was just such fun to be with. Yeah. And, um very irritating. <laughs> you know? Yeah, she wasn't on time, I bet, for your Oh, my shoot. God. When <laughs> I, had, I had so many interviews. But when David and I went down to the farm to do, um, do her on the tractor, yeah. uh, we waited four or five hours. Yeah. Yeah. They said, Mike Nichols said one thing, she'll, there are three things she'll never be. She'll never be dishonest, she'll never be mean, and she'll never be on time. That's true. <laughs> hours later. But I don't remember when I went to the house and saw all the paintings and everything. I don't remember her t being terribly late there, but I remember driving down with Ken early, and uh, we just were going berserk. You know, I mean, we spent the day. Yeah, it must have been interesting to see her in that um, environment. I interviewed Andre Leon Talley, mm -hmm. and he talked about how weird it was to see Elizabeth Taylor, the most glamorous woman, like wearing, you know, saddle shoes and like muddy in the dirt. But that was and, Elizabeth. Yeah. I mean, uh, Elizabeth was a very earthy yeah. woman um, and with earthy desires. Yes. And, um, and there was nothing phony. I mean, she is what she was, but she could drive you absolutely bananas. You know, you'd want to strike her at point. <laughs> of course, you didn't. But uh, it, it was just an amazing experience. Yeah. And I just wanted to tell you that John did think, and I don't know how accurate that is. And, and uh, I also, people have said that, but I always wonder, and, and he, he actually told me that too, but I always think in the back of my mind, are people saying that because Heinz, you know, you're looking at this guy who died in a plane crash and it was so devastating and she had PTSD the rest of her life because here you are, suddenly your husband's killed and you have three kids to take care of. Do you think that that's like wishful thinking that they would have stayed together? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I yeah, mean, I'm just telling, I wouldn't, yeah. you know, I just haven't got a clue. Yeah. But, um, this was his feeling, yeah. and uh, I've known him a long time. I don't think he would, he would not have lied to me. That's yeah. all I can yeah. tell you. But he could certainly have been wrong. <laughs> I wish he was still here. We all do. Oh, he, would, he would 
ask me, you know, he'd say, Katie, you got to get this book done. You got to hurry up. You got to get it out there. He well, you really did, and congratulations. Oh, thank you. I but think he it's was terrific. A huge reason. So thank you. Thank you for your story. <laughs> okay. Does anyone else have a question Any other for Kate? Questions? I'm going to close with one question. Okay. You're not getting off the okay. hook yet. Um, is there anyone currently who, in her sphere of public faces, who would even remotely compare to her now that you can think of? Um, no. <laughs> I just don't think there's anybody who approaches her kind of the all of the different things. I mean, she knew Dr. Fauci. You know, she knew, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci told me that, you know, he would, he gave her tours of the NIH and she knew what treatments they were working on for HIV and AIDS. And I just don't know if there's any celebrity now who's taken on a cause that controversial and is also an incredible actor. I mean, I know there are amazing activists and celebrities out there now, but it's almost a, too diffuse. There are too many, too many voices. And back then there were just a handful of really famous people that the studio created and cultivated. They, the studio destroyed people's lives at the same time. If you were gay, if you were a woman who was dating people that you weren't married to or you dressed a way they didn't like, you'd be out of a job. But at the same time, I think they, they gave so much power to people like Elizabeth. And I don't think that there's anybody like that today. Do you? I can't think of anyone. No. 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 But I, I, in the, doing that exercise in my head, I wonder if it's because of the times we live in, or if it's because, and like you said, there's yeah. just too many people out too there, people. or if it's, yeah, it's like a unique moment in time that I could mean, never be repeated, or if it's because there is actually no individual woman out there who embodies yeah. all that. I don't so. think so. I mean, Madonna, someone like Madonna, I guess, is very, very famous. And, and does a lot of important things, but it's just not like the singular person because there's really a handful of people. And that's what I think is interesting in the 20th century who kind of lived through all of this. End of the studio system, you know, the birth of celebrity coupledom and all of that. So. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Delightful. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you very much.